Hey guys, Dr. Davin Lim, board certified dermatologist. Today we'll be talking about um, retinol versus retinoids. Now we know that um, over the counter retinol is weaker than retinoids, but why do skincare companies uh, manufacture retinol and why don't they sell a retinoid? So let's take a step back and um, talk about the derivatives between uh, vitamin A. So Retinol is, uh, like I said, over the counter. You can buy that for many, many different types of skin companies. Um, they all have their own retinol formulation. Everything from uh, Murad to SkinCeuticals, um, The Ordinary, The Inky List, uh, Paula's Choice, it goes on and on and on. Every single skincare line will have their own uh, derivative of retinol. What's the difference between this compared to a prescription, for, for example, of Adapalene, which is called Differin, Tretinoin or Tazarotene. Um, these are all different generation retinoids. So retinoids are usually prescription. Yes, I do know that in the US uh, you can buy Adapalene over the counter and in some European countries, but in large, retinoids are usually medically prescribed while retinol don't have the same amount of uh, regulations compared to a retinoid. So the reason being is that uh, a retinoid uh, does not need conversion to retinoic acid. The retinol does. So uh, when we talk about how much of it's converted, it varies. It varies between uh, the formulation, it varies between the amount absorbed in, as well as individual factors. But realistically, anywhere between 0.5% all the way up to 2% gets converted to retinoic acid. Now, um, the prescription retinoids a lot more powerful because they do not need conversion in your skin. The problem being is that with uh, power becomes responsibility, with power also has side effects. So that's why when you're looking at prescription medications, so things like, um, like I mentioned, the Tazarotene, which is a third generation retinoids, also called Zorac, your second generation retinoids, for example, Adapalene, and your first generation uh, retinoids include Tretinoin. All of these will have side effects. There's a hundred percent chance, yeah? Uh, it depends on your skin's threshold. So if you use enough of it, if you have enough absorption uh, at a high enough concentration, everyone will experience side effects. Uh, unless, obviously, <laughs> there's very rare exceptions. So when we're looking at RAR, yeah, which, which is your retinoid uh, receptor, if you have polymorphisms with that um, and you don't have functioning receptors, that's very rare. So I've only seen one case in my life, um, but realistically 99.999% of patients will have side effects once the dose goes up or the amount gets absorbed. Now, what side effects can you experience from uh, medical retinoids? So basically it's dryness, burning, stinging, irritation, flakiness. Uh, redness as well. So some of the side effects are predictable. For example, a flaking of your skin. Reason being is because retinoids actually uh, increase your skin turnover. So instead of turning over every, for example, 25 to 28 days, they help speed up your skin's uh, turnover. So in other words, your dead skin cells get exfoliated, hence their use in uh, conditions, for example, like acne, psoriasis, and um, various other diseases of keratinization. In other words, um, how your skin actually uh, exfoliates. So instead of turning over that period of time, it quickens it. So it's anywhere between 18 to 21, 22 days. That's the reason why you get flaking. Redness is actually very common as well, because once again, it's, you know, when we're, dis we're I guess, discussing side effects, redness is not really a side effect of a retinoid. It's actually a, um, a an end point because uh, it creates more blood vessels and hence the word angiogenesis. That's why we, you know, as dermatologists, we say you've got the retinoid glow, which is basically the pink hue you get, uh, partly because of irritation, partly because of increased sun sensitivity, but also, uh, most importantly, because of increasing blood vessels in the papillary dermis. So uh, I broke the topic of sun sensitivity. Uh, you will get sun sensitive. The reason being is twofold. Number one, uh, you decrease uh, your stratum corneum, which is the top part of your skin. So that becomes more compact. Your epidermis actually plumps. It actually gets thicker, contrary to, um, uh, I guess, contrary to thought. Uh, and the other reason as well is that it increases photosensitivity. Most of the photosensitivity is in the long wave UVA. So unfortunately, 
not all sunscreens protect against long wave UVA. So that's why you still can get sunburn if you're in a retinoid, either topically or orally. Now, when we talk about side effects, we try to actually figure out how to mitigate those side effects. Sensible ways, including um, infrequent use. So instead of using it every night, you might want to use it every second night or every third night. So you don't have to use it every night for it to be effective. Once again, I tell all my patients to titrate, which means to start using very slowly, incorporating either retinol or retinoid in your skincare regime. So it might be something like two nights a week, or you know, for example, the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, give your skin a rest uh, over the weekdays. And if you can tolerate that, inverse that. So you might want to go Monday to Friday, give you a skin a break Saturday, Sunday. If you are experiencing irritation, you can actually decrease the actual concentration. So you can take a tiny pea-sized amount of your uh, retinoid, retinol or retinoid, and then mix it with uh, a moisturizer, a banal moisturizer, something like a hyaluronic acid-based moisturizer, uh, mix it together and then apply it. So that's one way. The second way is to actually use a moisturizer first um, and then, or you can use a moisturizer later, yeah? Um, so there are many ways to actually uh, help decrease irritation. The other thing as well is to use a frequent um, moisturizer application throughout the day. So you might want to use it, for example, at night, as in your moisturizer plus your retinoid, you want to wake up in the morning, you want to wash your face and then reapply a moisturizer because that can actually help um, your skin recover. It can actually decrease um, irritation and it can decrease flakiness. So these are all helpful hints in the context of uh, vitamin A. So it doesn't matter if you're using a retinoid or retinol, uh, these are helpful hints. Now we're back to the topic is why do skincare uh, manufacturers uh, decide to use retinol instead of retinoid? I guess there's two, two factors. First of all, regulation. So um, much like the FDA in um, the United States, there are regulatory bodies in Europe, for example, like the CE and in Australia, the TGA. Um, now, there are scientific uh, studies to show that high concentrations of retinoids, uh, and it's true, they can cause birth defects. So that's extrapolated to topical use as well. Most of the papers actually show uh, very high concentrations, so you need to actually have a lot, yeah? And they're in rats. So I understand why it's because of those uh, limitations with those papers. It's true, oral retinoids can cause birth defects. Hence the data is extrapolated to um, topical. So in, re in regards to retinol, there's no evidence. Um, there's no evidence because the conversion rate into retinoic acid is extremely small. So chances are by eating you know, two or three carrots, you're probably getting more um, uh, vitamin A or hypervitamatosis compared to um, just using retinol. So that's the first thing is legislation. The second is what, like what we've discussed, tolerability. So just imagine if a company, for example, like Murad or a company like The Ordinary or The Inky List, um, if they use, if they can provide a very high concentration of a active agent. So what happens is that with all of these formulations, yeah, across the board, companies test, yeah, so they test to ensure that the majority of patients don't get a reaction. Now, let's say you've gone from a retinol where your irritancy rate uh, for, for example, from a, a formulation is around, just give you an example, 2%, right? Which means you have 100 people who buy that product, two or three will get um, irritation, yeah, 2 to 3%. If they swap it to a retinoid, uh, the irritancy rate may go up to 15 to 20%. So the amount of refunds that the company's got to give would be ridiculous, um, and the name from themselves as well would be probably tarnished. Uh, due to the fact that the majority of patients uh, will, well, let's say the majority, the increased minority of patients will get a reaction. Um, so it makes it harder to use. Remember with skincare, it is actually designed for the, um, I guess, population out there. So they don't actually look at how good you are, how you understand how to actually apply a topical, uh, but they see how much uh, they can sell to the vast majority of patients. So 
that is the primary reason as well yeah it's because um the irritancy rate will be too high when you look at adapalene and how they market it in the us um there are two different concentrations that you can get a 0.1 and a 0.3 percent so i'm sure i'm absolutely certain that galderma actually looked at it and go look you know what if we're going to do this as the over-the-counter um retinoid let's stick with the 0.1 percent rather than the 0.3 because they know that the 0.3 the irritancy rate will be too high and hence it will affect the rating as in not the rating as in how effective it is but the rating as in how many people will get irritation so guys i hope you like that video it's a very short one on the uh, i guess differences between retinol retinoids and the real world experience um, guys by all means uh share comment like uh, i'll produce another video same time next week bye for now